everyone. I welcome you to the CC lecture series. I'm Nupur Chavla, teaching English literature at Maitri College, Delhi University. And in today's lecture, we are going to carry on our discussion of an important feminist text that is Women, Revolution and Resistance. This is a book that was written by the British feminist uh, Sheila Robertham in 1974. And in discussion is a particular chapter of this book that is colony with the, uh, uh, within the colony, right? Now, in this um, uh, chapter, one of the foremost um, uh, points that Robertham makes is that where she talks about the similarities between the colonization of the underdeveloped country and female suppression within capitalism. So there are these five points along which she establishes these similarities. We had discussed those points in the first lecture. Now we move on to the second part of our argument, right, um, in the same chapter. Now here she seems to depart from the point that, she, uh, that, that we have just discussed. So first she of course talks about the similarities. Then next in the chapter she talks about a point where analogy between the sexual and racial imperialism stops. All right. Now, this is the phrase that she uses. She says that, that there is a point in the experience of the colonized and the women uh, in the uh, capitalist society. And there is that point where the analogy between sexual and racial imperialism stops. Right? So, while there are similarities, but there are also those junctures where these similarities or this kind of an analogy does not seem to hold good. Now, what are those junctures? You see, the foremost, she says that the colonizers women, and she quotes, and, uh, and I quote, she says, that the colonizers women, their own superiority was insecure. They turned on the native women with a bitterness in which sexual and racial jealousy combine, unquote. So this is the first point of uh, departure that she talks about uh, in the two contexts, that is the context of the colonized country and the, the suppressed women. So she says that, you know, uh, the, uh, the colonizers, women then, they themselves were also insecure and because of that insecurity, they turned to the native women. Native women meaning women of the country which was colonized by the European powers, right? So women belonging to these colonizers uh, 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 or, the, or the colonizing countries, they were insecure and their attitude towards the colonized women was one of racial jealousy, racial and sexual jealousy. Now, what, what kind of a jealousy was that? You see, now it is historically known that uh, the colonizing uh, men also ex uh, not just exploited the colonized countries' economic resources, not just exploited or, you know, kind of undervalued the culture, but they also, you know, so to say, um, if we can uh, call it that, mistreated the women of the colonized countries as well. So they were also considered to be as their, um, um, uh, you know, um, as a property, if, if, if one can call it that, right? So they would then take those, uh, those kind of liberties with women. And when the colonizing men took those liberties with the native women or women of the colonized country, then the colonizers' women then, that is the reason why the colonizers' women felt that kind of a uh, racial sexual jealousy in that sense. So here we see uh, the first point of departure, right? Next, uh, Robertham also um, highlights. So, one, uh, so having uh, talked about the similarities between the uh, two contexts, then talking about the departure, the next point that she makes in this uh, chapter is whereby she talks about the complicated racial and sexual hierarchies in the European owned industrial establishments, right? Now, in this case, she is talking about the racial 
and the sexual hierarchies in the industrial establishments that were owned by the Europeans. So you see all throughout, what is she doing? The crux of her argument still remains this kind of a comparative framework of uh, racial suppression, racial subjugation and uh, subjugation along the lines of gender. So first she had looked at this uh, with respect to the uh, colonized countries context. Now she talks about it in the context of the industrial establishments uh, which were owned by the Europeans. And here she says that in these establishments uh, one can um, note that there were these complicated racial and sexual hierarchies, right? Uh, now what do we mean by that? She further el uh, elaborates when she uh, you know, explains that how the division of labor along both uh, the sexual and racial dimension with the European man at the top and indigenous African women at the bottom. So the, the, uh, the, the division of labor in these industrial, in these European owned industrial establishments was such whereby uh, it had both a racial as well as a dimension of the gender as well. So the European man then was kind of doubly advantaged, right, along the lines of his gender and also along the lines of his race. Therefore, he would be at the top of the division of labor, the, the highest rung in that sense. And the indigenous African women then would be at the bottom. Again, what? Doubly disadvantaged, right? Why? Because they're indigenous, they're from a different culture, and at the same time, they belong to uh, a gender that does not have a lot of say. So this is uh, one point of division of labor in a European settlement that she talks about. The other thing that Robertham also mentions is that in these settlements, in these uh, you know industrial settlements, she talks about the Chinese and the Indian men in similar jobs as European women, right? Now again, what do we notice? On the one hand, is this racial, so to say, disadvantage, if we can call it that, of the Chinese and the Indian men, right? On the other hand, is the gender disadvantage of the uh, being a woman. So what we notice is the Chinese and the Indian men would be in similar jobs as compared to the European women. Next, we notice within these establishments, the indigenous group as well. If you we look at the indigenous group, even within them, women would form a small percentage of population with education and jobs. These women uh, would not, um, you know, kind of uh, a very uh, a very small percentage would be of women who would get education, who would get jobs, while men would be the ones that would take away all these opportunities. Right. Next, what she says is that in the text. Robertham talks about imperialism, how imperialism has served to generalize discontent as well. And that's the phrase which she uses in the uh, chapter 2. She says that, you know, demands like monogamy, birth control, education, they combine with the desire for economic security, the right to land, control of markets and expulsion of foreigners, right? So we see that how imperialism then is that concept which generalizes discontent. Generalizes uh, discontent means again what? That we notice that in both the contexts, uh, the idea of monogamy, the idea of birth control, the idea of education, both these which seem to be particularly the concerns concerning women, they combine with the desire for economic security. Right? So we see both these elements then come together and imperialism then becomes that kind of a uh, joining factor there. Now further, Robertham highlights that in 1920s and the 30s, the incipient feminism in the developing countries in that sense, you know, resembled early equal rights feminism of the middle class women in the capitalist societies. Again, Robertson is pointing our attention, is, is bringing our attention to the fact that how imperialism then, when we understand the way it operates, it helps us 
also understand the way uh, you know kind of uh, discrimination existed in uh, along the lines of gender as well so in the 1920s and the 30s the incipient feminism incipient feminism means what a very early form of feminism right in the developing countries then it actually resembled the equal rights feminism of the middle class women in the capitalist societies as well so you see again the concerns in a imperialist framework right uh, the concerns now you see now what was uh, the 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 aspect or the or the defining reality of the developing countries that an imperial power would have some kind of a control over these countries right now during that time when feminism in the 20s and the 30s started to kind of you know raise head in these countries it seemed to resemble the movement or the women's movement even in the middle class capitalist societies as well so the developing countries and the capitalist societies the commonality being the women's movement and how they seem to echo each other right and that's why robertson says that imperialism then becomes that kind of a, uh, a common factor which helps us understand the idea of discontent whereby discontent along economic lines seem to echo the discontent along the lines of gender so there seems to be some kind of a overlap over there and that is the observation that robertson makes right next she also talks about the individual acts of resistance by women right now that's a very important point that she makes in the chapter talking about the individual acts of resistance by women in the third world robertson says and i quote it is only in the abnormal circumstances of political revolt that it is possible for women to take uncustomary actions unquote now what is she trying to say over here she says now she's talking about the acts of resistance uh, undertaken by individual women she says that it 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 wasn't possible for women to raise their voice in usual circumstance right it's only in the abnormal circumstances that she says of political revolt right in the circumstances where there was a kind of political uh, you know this uh, discontent that was going on that in in such a situation it was possible for women to take uncustomary actions now what do we mean by uncustomary actions it basically implies those actions which were not uh, uh, you know so to say traditionally uh, ascribed to women so all those things that women would not traditionally or conventionally do they were able to do all of that within the circumstances of the political revolt so almost as if robertham is trying to establish that the situation of political turmoil then became the uh, uh, breeding ground in that sense or became a kind of an inspiring force for women to assert themselves individually through actions <clears throat> that they may not have done before right so uh, developing on this um, observation she talks about the national independence movements of different countries right and how they created an impetus for active involvement of women right that's the point that she makes so she uh, actually uh, you know kind of uh, goes into the example of um, various third world countries including uh, uh, you know india uh, she 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 talks about the arab context and she says that how you know the independence movements of these third world countries independence from the colonizers right they these movements are then seen to be creating are uh, are are seen to have created that kind of a force or that impetus that helped in the active involvement of women right um otherwise these women who would not be able to assert themselves so um, radically they were able to do so in the context of these movements so we see that how robertson seems to be uh, giving this this kind of a particular importance to this political turmoil now talking about india you know she uh, she she gives the example of india in this chapter and she said that women played an important role in resisting the british 
right? So, when uh, uh, India was fighting the British rule, was resisting the British rule, she says that women played a very significant role and one must not forget that. And particularly, she talks about the mutiny of 1857 and she said that it was the women who had urged men to rise in the mutiny of 1857. It's the women's, uh, um, you know, so to say, a power that gave impetus to men to, um, you know, act against the uh, Britishers uh, during the mutiny of 1857. So again, <clears throat> highlighting what? That in a, uh, uh, in a uh, context of the political turmoil, women taking charge, right? Likewise, she also says that, you know, um, Apart from these uh, national uh, liberation movements, even educated women later were part of various religious groups and organizations like the Theosophical Society by Annie Besant. So it's not only the fact that <clears throat> women played a seminal role in these national movements, but they were also part of these various religious groups and organizations like the Theosophical Society that was founded by Annie Besant, right? So from here, she actually goes on to, uh, 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 you know, uh, kind of uh, wrap up this argument that she makes about uh, this political context and women. And she says, and I'll very quickly quote, she says that bourgeois nationalism has proven incapable of answering the needs of the third world women. <clears throat> it is only when national liberation struggles have become revolutionary movements that real problems of women's liberation have been considered, right? So she basically is, is pointing to the fact that how <clears throat> the idea of nationalism in the conventional sense then has proven to be incapable of answering the needs of the third world women. So the idea of uh, equal representation, equal rights, equal access, um, all these questions, all these needs uh, were not uh, factored in the usual sense of nationalism, but instead it required the national liberational struggles, right? These revolutionary movements, these were the moments when problems of women's liberation were genuinely considered, right? So if we notice very clearly in this, uh, in this part of the lecture, we have seen two very important points that Robertson makes. First, she talks about the idea of uh, commonality between imperialism or the colonized countries, uh, people and the suppressed women. Next, she talks about how imperialism has served to generalize discontent. She talks about the meeting point of um, uh, the need for economic liberation and liberation along the lines of gender. And last, she makes this very important point over here where she talks about the fact that how uh, moments of political turmoil have proven in the history to be very strong grounds that gave impetus for women to assert themselves and come into their own, right? So these are some of the arguments that she makes with respect to the third world context and feminism. So I would urge you to read this book, look into the chapter and understand this uh, very interesting connection that Robertson makes between feminism and the third world context. Thank you.